All right. Can you guys see me? Can you hear me? We're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm uh, got my iPad over here. At the, you can see how long the lag is, you know, between uh, me clicking it live and the stuff actually showing up. So let me know if you can hear me. Um, today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics in all of investing, and it's basically stock market bubbles and, and valuation in general. So I'm going to go ahead and get my uh, screen sharing set up here, which should just take me a quick second. Let me, like I said, let me know if you guys can uh, can hear me or not. And I'm going to flip over to my. Uh, where, where are we here? Okay, I'm going to hide that. Oh. All right. I got a smiley face from Bruce. That's good. I know that's probably quite the lag, but can everyone? All right, Eric, I finally see one that you guys can hear me. Um, let me know if you can see what's on my screen too, because uh, I'm still I'm still getting a pretty good lag. Oh, here we go. That's why. That's why. I got to be smarter than the software. So hopefully that's about all the time we can we're going to lose here on this. So today we're going to be talking about stock market bubbles. We're going to be talking about you know, how you can identify them. Are we in one? You know, what, where do we go from here? What's the history of stock market bubbles? And, uh, you know, what, what do you do if you're in one? So let, let's go ahead and get started. So first off, a bubble. The idea of a bubble. A bubble is an economic cycle, and it's characterized by rapid escalation in the price of something in a short period of time. I bolded the pieces that are really important. So it's a cycle, meaning that there's been a long history of bubbles that will show you it's something that um, you know, it, it can feel unnatural, but when it comes to free markets, you're going to have these, you're going to have bubbles and the rapid escalation is really key when it comes to a bubble. And it also has to happen really quickly. So that's, that's where you get into the, the actual definition of a bubble. The fast inflation is followed by a quick decrease in value or a contraction. And that's sometimes referred to as like the bubble popping or bursting or a crash and those types of things. So the first thing I want to say about bubbles as bubbles are rooted in human psychology. This is not something that is, uh, you know, some weird, you know, aspect that like only has happened since the dawn of the computer age, or it's not something driven by like programs or algorithms or any of that stuff. In fact, we'll show you in a minute, some of the biggest bubbles of all time happened way before any of that technology. So this is something that's deeply ingrained in, in human psychology. When, you, when you're trying to identify if you're in a bubble, I really think it comes down to two things. So the first one is extreme sentiment. What I mean by that is back in 2017 and 18, when Bitcoin was going from like 300 up to five grand, it happened super quick in like a month or two. I was hearing things like, I'm going to just quit my job. You know, I have all this Bitcoin or I'm going to start trading Bitcoin and, you know, I'd, I'd be getting... Uh, I'd be getting some service done at my house. Someone would be working on, you know, an appliance or something. And they'd be, they'd be asking me about Bitcoin and telling me I need to buy Bitcoin and stuff like that. And usually that is when you start to get a pretty good indication that you're in some sort of bubble. The other thing that's one of the most famous bubble quotes of all time is back in 1929. So literally right before the crash and the Great Depression, there's a real famous quote that stocks have reached a permanently high plateau. And the, the thinking was, oh, they'll never crash again. We're never going to have a pullback again. We're never going to have a recession again. That's That type of extreme level of sentiment is usually indicative of a bubble. So uh, whoops. So another, another uh, thing to keep in mind, okay, I, I rearranged the slides real quick before we did this. So the actual cycle in terms of how a bubble forms is, is so common. There's such a common thread be between how these all go. And I'll show you a bunch of bubbles in just a minute, but there's actually almost a pattern. So when, when you see it, um, I, don't, I don't know how well my mouse is gonna show up here, but over here on the left, you have this phase where like people are getting built up into an asset. It's not really public yet. More people are becoming aware of it here and it kind of sells off a little bit. Then as it grows, you're getting more media attention, you're getting more enthusiasm, then you're getting like outright greed. And then up in here is where you really start to get into dangerous territory. This is like a delusional, you know, they call it delusion and a new paradigm where people are starting to say things like this time it's different. You know, um, this company can really be worth a hundred trillion dollars, you know, crazy stuff like that. You get this little thing called a bull trap and then you know, usually, usually when people totally quit on whatever that asset is, that's usually about the time you want to start getting in. So anyway, quick, 
you know, we've talked about psychology. This is some psychology. I don't like to get into the prediction game, but if you really press me right now, I would say we're somewhere in here. So I, I don't really believe that we're way up here in the in the new paradigm area, but uh, but I do believe we're somewhere between enthusiasm and like greed. There are parts of the market that I think are full on in delusion and new paradigm mode. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on this Wealth Wednesday. But I think for the market as a whole, we're actually probably more down in here. Some sectors of the market were up in here. So we'll talk about which is which and kind of what to do about it. But the other key point about a bubble is valuation. So what that means is like, how good of a deal are you getting in this investment? So in 1999, the NASDAQ, so tech, tech stocks, traded at 118 times cash flow. So if, if you're not real familiar with this stuff, cash flow is super simple. It just means the cash income, so like the, the sales, minus the cash expenses. And that gives you a number called cash flow, and it's the most important thing when it comes to running a business. You know, it's it's not that cash is king. When you're running a business, cash flow is king. How much money's coming in the door versus how much is going out the door. So what this meant is you had to invest $118 in the NASDAQ back in 1999 to get a measly $1 of cash flow each year. So that meant if there was no growth, you wouldn't get your money back for 118 years. Okay, now obviously you wouldn't do that, right? Nobody would put their money in to something and, and think it's going to be 118 year payback. The thinking was, oh, it's going to double and triple and quadruple. And, you know, someday these companies are going to be cash flowing billions and billions and billions of dollars. So really what it is, is not that people are comfortable paying 118 times cash flow. It's really that they're way overly optimistic on what the growth trajectory is going to be on those businesses. And they're, they're really just kind of, <laughs> that's the new one. That's Harper, the uh, two week old you're hearing in the background, or I guess three week old now. Yeah, we're up. She's three weeks old now. So that's cool. But, um, but anyway, to, to look at that through clearer glasses, you're paying 0.84 or you're sorry, you're receiving a 0.84% yield on a super risky asset. You're owning tech stocks and you're getting a, a terrible, terrible return on your investment. So we're going to talk about valuations today. But before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of a history of bubbles. So this is a, a chart that's a pretty famous chart. I think I got this one from Bloomberg, but it shows all these different asset bubbles. And the, the um, axis over here, the y-axis, is about how many times the uh, starting price, I don't know why it's kind of, there we go, how many times the starting price the asset got up to. So what the, the blue one here is the Mississippi land bubble back in the early 1700s. In about a one-year period, you went from down here all the way up to 30 times your money in a year. Okay, and then we also had like uh, the orange one here, that was the South Sea bubble. That was a really big one. You know, the tulip bubble was a, a historical one where again, you made 30 times your money in a year or two. The Bitcoin one is really interesting. And this is from back actually in 2017, 2018. It ran from a couple hundred bucks all the way up, I think to like 20,000 or something like that, and then sold off really hard. These are classic bubbles. The tech bubble is this little green one down here. So the, the stock market bubble that we saw back in 1999 and 2000 from a historical standpoint was kind of a baby bubble, even though we were at 118 times cash flow. So that, this is just goes to show you how crazy people can get, basically. You're only doing this because you think you're going to be able to sell it to somebody else at a crazier valuation. You're only willing to pay 118 times cash flow because you think tomorrow it's going to be at 150 times cash flow and you can sell it off to some other... Uh, you know, some other mark or some other person that's going to get suckered. So what I would say is keep this all in mind. This is the context within bubbles. Most of the time, stock market bubbles are, are little tiny baby bubbles and that other asset classes can get way crazier. Bitcoin can run way further. You know, and we'll even show a couple other assets that have a tendency to get even more inflated. But um, even if we had a 10x return, okay, so even if we went from, um, like, let, what's the craziest stock out there right now? Like Tesla, it is totally possible that even though you made 10 times your money on Tesla in the last year, you might only be right here on this chart. As crazy as that sounds. And now, am I a big uh, believer that, you know, everyone should go out and buy a ton of Tesla because it's going to the moon? No, that's not how we operate. We are not short term traders. We're not out there trying to flip things for, you know, 50% in a real short period of time. I'm just telling you that in the context of how far a bubble can run, nobody has any idea. This stuff is super unpredictable. And uh, 
keep that in mind because we'll talk about predictions. No one that can successfully predict markets needs to manage somebody else's money. So to, to put that to put that in a little bit clearer terms, some of these uh, some of these investors that have a really really good track record of doing this stuff. So they they've been able to you know they got the tech bubble right, they got two thousand eight right. Um, there are guys like that and gals, by the way, that, that have gotten those correct. Most of them, all of them that I know of are not taking outside investor money. So if, if you're able to pretty consistently predict economic cycles and economic movements, why would you worry about someone else's money? By that point, you're probably already a billionaire. And uh, most of them have a tendency to try to keep their future moves as private as they possibly can so that they can maximize the profits. So if someone ever comes to you and says, hey, this is a bubble, this is what to do, short the market, do this, blah, 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 I know it's gonna work, I'm super confident, take it with a grain of salt because anyone that can really do that consistently doesn't need outside investors. They don't need to sell you some system on, on how to go make 50%, they'll just do it. They're, you know, that's Keep that in mind. Also, the, the track record of people calling bubbles is, is long and uh, you know not good, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So this is just the last 10 years, some, uh, some headlines we grabbed. So back here on the bottom, January 11th, 2010, US stocks surged back towards bubble territory. That was, that was in 2010 from Business Insider. And then 2011, why the stock market looks like the tech bubble of 2000. And then 2012, Robert Schiller, you know, who's a very famous guy in economics, says there's another tech bubble. This is in 2012, okay, this is, 50% ago or 100% ago in a lot of these names. Uh, 2013, Nobel Prize war winner warns of US stock market bubble. 2014, time to worry about stock market bubbles. That was from the New York Times. 2015, from the Financial Times, fear grow, fears grow over US stock market bubble. 2016, from CNN, uh-oh, is the stock market in a bubble again? 2017, from USA Today, is the stock market in a bubble again? 2018, CNBC, epic market bubble ready to burst. 2019, Forbes, US stock market is a bubble. <laughs> 2020, Business Insider, legendary investor is certain we're in a bubble. Okay, so you're, you're seeing, hopefully you're getting the point. I know that this was a little bit drawn out, a little bit over the top, but my point is we've moved 100% while well, all these people were talking that we're in a bubble, we're in a bubble, we're in a bubble. So take all that stuff with a grain of salt. In a minute, we're going to go through the valuations and we're going to go through where I believe we really are in this cycle and why. But whenever you hear some famous person calling for a bubble, please keep this table in mind. There's a lot of people out there that have been calling bubbles for a long time that have a really terrible track record. So um, the, the two most famous bubble calls, in my opinion, or uh, you know the, the biggest, most reputable bubble calls, Back towards the end of 1995, Ray Dalio, who's a very famous guy now, but back then was kind of in his prime, in his heyday, if you will, he said, I think we're approaching a blow-off phase in the U.S. stock market. He told that to an institutional money management magazine called Pension and Investments. And he said, price acceleration is preceding a significant correction. I think we're going to fall 20% over the next 18 months. And then Peter Lynch, who's another super famous investor, at this point was almost like the, I, I don't know what you'd call it. He was like the Michael Jordan of investing in 1995. He was he was like the most dominant, you know, whether you want to call it LeBron James or, you know, Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers. I mean, this was the guy when it came to investing. And he he said in the same period, in 1995, the worth worth magazine he said yeah not enough investors are worried they were calling for a big time market bubble and i tell you that because they made that call in late 1995 here we are over here late 1995 well wouldn't you know it the market ran another 150 percent from where these two famous guys were calling for that bubble and of course you're probably saying yeah but then the market crashed there was this big tech sell-off and i agree there was so right here you see the market kind of rolled over Sold off, sold off, sold off pretty hard down in here. You know, we had, uh, I think this one right here was probably 9 11. You know, keep selling off 2002, 2003. But my point is, even down in this range, as bad as it got after 9 11 and the tech bubble and everything else, you're still up 40% from where those guys were calling for a bubble. And by the way, the market was much, much, much cheaper over here than it was over here. So, what I mean by that is the business's growth the actual cash flows and earnings actually grew pretty significantly over this period, such that you were better off investing, you know, even halfway through a bubble, you still came out ahead. And the, the, as bad as it got, it still didn't get bad enough to be negative for, for you, you know, as long as you got in and stayed in. And also, I'd like to make this point, 
So let's assume that uh, you are the worst investor ever. You have the absolute worst timing. You took all of your money and you and you put it in cash back in 1995 or 1996. And uh, you know you said we're in a bubble. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to ride it out in cash. And then let's say that you got you got you know suckered into paying it at the exact top. So right up here, you got in at the very worst, very highest, worst possible time. What happened to you over the last 20 years? Well, you're up three x. Okay, so if if you pulled all your money out, you pulled your half a million bucks out. And you sat and waited and you screwed it up and you got in on the worst possible day. Yeah, you took a 50% drop and then you took another 50% drop. But my point being, even if you got it perfectly, exactly wrong, you're still up 260%. Okay, meaning meaning 100 grand went up 262 grand. So 100 grand turned into 362 grand. You're actually almost up four times your money. So, um, you know, and a lot of that has come since the financial crisis. But again, that's if you got it perfectly bad. If you're still in an addition mode, if you're still in contribution and accumulation mode, you actually want the market to do this one or two more times before you retire. You want to be able to get in down in here. You want to be able to get more money in down in here. And, and you want this to be a bubble. You want the bubble to blow off. You want there to be a crash. You want to be able to keep buying. So don't try to get into a timing game. Because my point is, even if your timing is terrible, the, uh, the old line is that your time in the market, as in the amount of years that you spend invested, is more important than timing the market. So time in the market is more important than timing the market. And my opinion on what the best move is to do in a market bubble is, is quite simple. It's just to own the best businesses in the world. Okay, and we can talk about, we can go back and forth and pick names and, and talk through what the best businesses are or whatever, but um, my belief so like if you popped open the, my my accounts, I actually thought about throwing one of my statements in here, but if you popped open one of my accounts, let's take like my Roth IRA, the entire account is in one ticker symbol and it's not a stock, okay? It's a big, giant, super cheap index fund, okay? It's SCHX. So I, I should probably put some qualifiers on there. This is not a recommendation. We don't know your situation, all that type of stuff. Make sure you go talk to someone that knows your situation, that's a fiduciary. But it's a broadly diversified basket of the 750 biggest companies in the United States. I don't know that all 750 of those companies are the best companies to own, but I bet you two or 300 of them are gonna do so well over the next 20 or 30 years that I'm gonna be really, really, really glad that I bought in and that I let them ride. And the other thing to keep in mind here is I showed you I showed you the returns of holding the whole market if if you were exposed to the very worst sectors. So let's say you got in at the very dumb time like I like I showed you, but you got into the worst stuff. Your technology at one point was down 75, 80% in that range. If you owned these super quality companies, you were only down 20 to 30%. I know that you're like, oh, but I'm still down 20 to 30%. I talk a lot about bond alternatives and different things like that. We have a video um, in this group called the new 6040, where I talk at length about safer bond alternatives that, that are principle protected, that outpace inflation, where you don't have to take this kind of hit. But I think for most people, if you've got a piece of your portfolio that's gonna be invested for 10 or 20 or 30 years, you're better off owning these great companies. I mean, and, and maybe you take a little bit of a, a loss if you totally screw up the timing and get it perfectly wrong. But if you do it how we recommend it and you spread your purchases out, you know, and then and then leave them in for a long period of time, it's only very recently that tech has been able to catch up to these big boring businesses. So tech's been on this crazy ripper for the last, you know, basically since the start of the pandemic. And it's only because of that that it's gotten within spitting distance of some of the best, most quality companies in the world. So when I say that, like what kind of companies? Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Disney, you know, all these that don't sound super exciting, but they beat tech over the last 20 years because of the risk factor that you had in tech. So let's talk to, I'm not saying throw all your money in every stock and throw all your money in stocks across the board and everything's going to work out fine. There are areas in the market right now that I think are extremely dangerous. So one of them is low quality tech companies. And when I say low quality, I'm not talking about Microsoft. I'm talking about some of these companies you're seeing out there that they uh, have an idea for a software package, but they don't have any sales. They don't have any revenues. You know, they have a five person team and they're trading at $10 billion. Okay, that is something that right now I think is very, very, very dangerous. There's also some individual stocks that are in some crazy situations that 
that just basically don't make any sense in reality. In some of these areas, I think you are getting up into the delusion phase on that on that psychology chart. I think you're getting up into delusion and new paradigm and those types of those types of heights. But in the most of the rest of the market, I would actually say we're, we're much lower down. I mean, when I talk to most people right now, they are not super enthusiastic about the market. They're terrified. They think it's going to crash. They think every you know everything's going to hell. And you know, there's I would say from a sentiment standpoint, it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, now in some of these areas, it's really, really, really good. You know, like in software, some of the some of the sentiment levels are off the charts high. But that's just certain areas. So I would say avoid those. You know, I, I would say if you're a retiree that's taking income, maybe just back off on the tech a little bit. We would never say to not have any money in tech, but there's no reason for you to have a third of your money in technology, especially just being at some of the valuation levels we're looking at. But um, this is a chart that I pulled. So this is non-profitable software companies and they're actually up uh where is it here so basically from the pandemic early part of the pandemic they're up an average of like 4x okay so re remember that now they're they're that's just over the last couple of months and some of these companies i, I would even venture to say most of these companies aren't going to make it and and you're buying at these crazy levels don't look at things on the performance over the last six months or the last year or the last two years. Last year doesn't count. We're investing for next year and the next five years and the next 10 years. And I think a lot of these companies would have to absolutely shoot the lights out operationally. Like they would have to just explode their sales. They would have to explode their earnings just to make these numbers reasonable. And they wouldn't even be good from an entry standpoint. So to me, could that work out? You know, could, could they double again from here? Yes, they could. But what game are you playing? Are you playing the quick money? I'm trying to double my money quick. I'm, you know, kind of gambling type of game. Or are you playing a game of, I want to own the best businesses in the world and I want to hold them for 20, 30, 40 years? Because that's the game that I like to play. That's the game that our clients like to play. So again, low quality tech companies, try to avoid those as much as you can. The, uh, the uh, stock market as a whole right now. So we're, we'll talk about bonds here. This might surprise you. I, I said at the beginning that tech traded at 118 times cash flow back in the tech bubble. Well, the stock market only trades at 15 times cash flow right now. That's one five, 15 times cash flow. So that means if you invest $100 in the stock market right now, those businesses are going to cash flow almost six and a half dollars. Now, you don't get to see that all. They're only going to pay you out a dollar or two dollars in dividends. What are they doing with the other four dollars and 45 cents? They're reinvesting it in the business. They're trying to grow that earnings, grow those dividends. And, and that bond, if you go out and buy a bond right now, you make a hundred dollar investment, you're getting two or three percent per year in interest. But that's not the crazy thing. To me, the crazy thing on a bond is how little to no growth you're gonna get. So I know right now, if a bond is yielding two percent, that means if I put a hundred bucks in a bond, a 10-year bond, I'm gonna get two dollars in income this year, two dollars in income next year, two dollars in income in year three, two dollars in year four, all the way out to year 10. And I know that in year 10, I'm going to get two dollars in income and then I'm going to get my original principal back. So we'll assume that the company doesn't default or anything. We'll just assume it's like a government bond. I know that I'm taking a fixed two percent return, a fixed two dollar income versus with stocks right now. If I buy into the stock market, yeah, I'm only getting a two dollar dividend, but they're reinvesting so much of those cash flows that if you just take a historical growth rate, if they, if they just go out and get like a 7% growth rate, something like that, year 10, your dividend income would be $4. Year 20, your dividend income would be $8. Year 30, your dividend income would be $16. I left that off because I didn't want to get into like, you know, crazyville. But uh, stocks have the potential to grow. When you buy a stock, this is not some piece of paper that can shoot all over the place. You're buying a business. You're investing your money alongside Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos or you know even Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook. You're you're investing along some of these people that are that are you know love them hate them whatever they're brilliant people and they're focused every day on growing their money and you get to invest right alongside of them. You get to do no work basically when you invest in in say uh, you know like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, their whole team they work for you. 
they're on your payroll. They're trying to, to grow your wealth because you're you're all aligned in terms of incentives. And some people see that and they go, oh, sure, growth potential's there, that's great, but the market is expensive. And my question is relative to what? I said earlier in this webinar, tech was trading at 118 times cash flow back in 2000. That was a 1% yield. It was like 0.84 or whatever I said. But that was at a time that bonds were paying 5 and 6%. So if you think about it in terms of that, stocks were five or six times more expensive. You had to put in five times more money into stocks to get the same amount of income from bonds. Right now, stocks are trading at 15 times cash flow. Again, about a 6% yield. Even tech, crazy expensive tech, tech's at 22 times cash flow. Okay, so that, that's a very far cry from the 118 times cash flow that we saw back in the tech bubble. And it, it's, you know, again, if you're at, if you're at uh, 22 times cash flow, you're still getting a higher income than you'd be getting from a bond. If you look at a bond at, at a 3% cash flow or 3% yield, that's like saying you're at 33 times earnings or 33 times cash flow. So my question to you is what's really expensive here? the stocks that are at 15 times cash flow or the bonds that are at 33 times cash flow. So keep that in mind. Also, I'm hearing some things out there when I talk to people, well, stocks are at 25 times earnings. You know, that's how expensive they were back in the tech bubble. And, and that, A, that's not really true. But B, my question would be, do you think that the last 12 months, so the, the calendar year of 2020, do you think that was a good year or a bad year for most companies? Obviously, the answer is it was a horrible year terrible year, you know, uh, awful year, horrific year. And I, I completely agree. So I might say going forward, maybe the prospects look a little bit better. Maybe those businesses are actually going to have higher sales, higher earnings, higher cash flows than what they look like if you're just looking at a trailing 12 month basis. And uh, also remember, I said it on the last slide, but bonds were paying 50% more than stocks back in 1999. That's how expensive they got. So on stocks, you had a you were at 25 times earnings. So at, you know if you put $100 in, you were getting a $4 earnings back, and if you put $100 in bonds, you were getting a $6 earnings back. So so bonds were actually the better deal back then. Today we have bond yields at 3%, stock yields at 6%. So if if we if we said, hey, I think the market let's let's say we go, hey, I think the market is going to get as a uh, you know, I, I want it to get as expensive as it was back in the tech bubble. The Dow would have to be at 60,000 or 70,000 or 80,000 or 90,000. That, that's how crazy things would have to get to be back like the tech bubble. And I ask again, you know, what's expensive here, stocks or bonds? And there's also more hidden risk in bonds. So some bond principal risk. If interest rates go up 1%, bonds on average, so the bond market as a whole, like a BND or, a, you know, those types of ETFs, bonds as a whole will lose 6% of their principal value. So you'll still get, let's say you get like your 2% income, but then your principal value drops 6%, you're in the whole 4%. And we haven't even started talking about taxes or inflation yet. And do we know when interest rates are going to change? No, we don't. I'll be the first to say I'm not the best dude in the world at trying to predict stuff like that. I don't even attempt to predict interest rates. But I would guess that at some point over the next 20 or 30 years, interest rates are going to be higher than what we're seeing right now. And the, the longer your time horizon, the more likely you're gonna take this principal loss in a bond. Okay, the, the longer you're gonna be invested, in my opinion, the riskier bonds are. And by the way, what other asset class is super dependent on interest rates? Think about it for a minute. What, what, uh, what asset class out there is mostly driven by debt and mostly driven by um, in borrowing rates? And the, the answer I, I hope is pretty obvious, real estate. So if rates go up 1%, the payment on a 30-year mortgage goes up 13%. Now, again, I'm not saying that I think real estate prices are going to crash. That's not really what I believe. Um, you know, I, I certainly hope they don't crash. You know, I, I want everyone to make money, even the, even the just regular, you know, real estate investors. I want everyone to be wealthier. But uh, I do think that over the long run, again, over the next 20 years or so, if we do see any kind of like quarter point rise in interest rates or half point rise in interest rates or anything like that, People are not going to be able to afford paying as much in purchase prices on these properties. And what does that mean today? Well, I would say what it, what it would mean to me is this might, this might be on the better end of where prices get. Again, they can double from here. But like 
I, I think this is a very strong real estate market. I think I would I would like to be a seller in this market, but you know, <laughs> I got uh, a family of five. We need a, a fairly you know decent size area. But if you're in a situation where you're retired and you're thinking about downsizing, I think this is a really interesting time to sell some real estate, buy something a little bit smaller, and lock in a really good long term interest rate in the process. Um, you know, if I was 65 and retired right now and my adult kids were out of the house, we would definitely be downsizing out of this house. You know, I'm not saying going all the way to a condo, but it, it's just a very interesting time, I think. And um, I would like to take advantage before real estate starts becoming a little bit, uh, you know, more under pressure from an interest rate standpoint. So in summary, bubbles are part of the human psychology. We've always had bubbles. There will always be bubbles. As, as long as there's... Uh, as long as there's human beings trading in the market, there will be asset bubbles. I don't know what the next one's going to be. At some point, there's going to be a, a bubble over, uh, you know, asteroid mining companies. And people like to chase the shiny new thing and the, the quick growing, quick, you know, explosive, high potential thing. We like to chase shiny objects. So just keep that in mind. Always try to step away from the herd a little bit. Look at things a little bit independently. I want to just reiterate this. This stuff is super, super difficult, if not impossible to predict. I'm kind of in the camp that it's impossible to predict because there's nothing to stop. If you're already willing to pay 25 times cash flow, why wouldn't you pay 30 times cash flow? Why wouldn't you pay 35 times cash flow? Why wouldn't you pay 50 times cash flow? And what that would imply, the Dow could double from here. You know, and again, I, I don't, I don't know or think that that's going to happen. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying that it's very difficult to predict. And what I would rather do is place my bet with the best businesses in the world. I'm going to go out and buy the highest quality, best run, best businesses in the world. And I'm going to avoid the most dangerous parts of the market. So I'm going to avoid speculative technology stocks. I'm going to avoid bonds. I'm going to avoid real estate. And in general, you know, right now, if I can get a if I can get a six percent or seven percent or eight percent cash flow yield from a really high quality business, that might double that cash flow over the next five or ten years. I'm going to do that all day long, and I'm not even really that nervous buying right now. I just think that if if you're in the wrong areas, if you're out there buying, you know, one of these quiet one of these uh, flashy new tech companies, that that could potentially work out in a very bad way. If the sales don't materialize and stuff like that, that company could very well go to zero. So. Be picky, but uh, don't don't be so scared that you take no action because the very worst thing you could do is be so afraid of a bubble that you sit in cash for 20 years and the market triples or quadruples again from here because we know prices are gonna go up over that 20 or 30 year period. So uh, in summary, Again, you don't need more money, you need a better plan. We say it every time on every one of these videos. If you're still nervous about the position or about the situation in the market, I would say it probably just means that you're personally taking too much market risk. And, and the way to fix that is really simple. You know, take take advantage of some bond alternatives. Go check out the video, the uh, the new 6040. If you'd like to see that, comment down below, and we'll we'll connect you up with that older video showing some different bond alternatives. It, it might make sense to hold a little bit more cash than you usually do. I, I I think that's reasonable, especially if you know you want to be ready for an opportunity, or you think you might sell your house soon, and you want to be in a good position to. Uh, to be in, in uh, I, I just saw a question here from uh, from John Kimball. Hi, John. I know we just talked on the phone or texted or whatever a little bit ago, but uh, yeah, that was a thirty-year mortgage. So for every for every one percent rise in uh, interest rates, a thirty-year mortgage will become thirteen percent more expensive. So that that's to the buyer. So what I mean there is, if you're a seller, keep in mind that if there's a if there's a quarter percent rise in interest rates, that that your home basically just got 3% more expensive to the person that might be buying it, if that makes sense. And then, uh, yeah, and then I see Eric just jumped in there, the 13% uh, on a 30-year mortgage. So thanks again, everybody, for watching. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang out on here for a minute if anybody else has any additional questions. If there's anything else we can help you out with, go check out our website, safeguardinvest.com. You know, poke around on there. We got all the fees on there and everything. We got some of our more... Uh, you know, tax planning. We, we like to focus on the controllables. I didn't really touch on that in this video, but um, I, I can't control what the market does. I can't control if we're in a bubble or if things are, you know, going to get more expensive or if things are going to crash, but I can control tax planning. And like we say all the time, you don't need more money, you need a better plan. It's a lot easier to, uh, you know, drop your taxes 20 or 30 percent than it is to go make 20 or 30% really quickly in the market. You know, the market in the long run is a, it's a great vehicle, but you gotta be around for the long haul. 
if you're trying to time it really quickly, I would say you're better off focusing on things that are a little bit easier to control, like getting your taxes down, getting your RMDs down, you know, uh, making sure you're not falling into the social security tax trap, all those different types of things. So again, I don't want to run super long. I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, this is one of my favorite topics in the entire world of investing. We got a lot of feedback through those questionnaires we did that people wanted to see more investment content. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to provide a little bit more investment information for people, share not only our philosophy, but just some cool stuff like this. You know, what do bubbles look like? What, uh, what's the history of bubbles? What are the valuations in the market right now? You know, what sectors might benefit from a, from a Biden economy? What might the, you know, the, what might the world look like? And we don't want to get too much into a hard timing, but uh, you can see the big trends out there. And uh, yeah, you're very welcome, Andy. Ho hopefully the video was helpful. Uh, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut, cut the feed here. Thank you guys so much for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for uh, another edition of Wealth Wednesday.